Um, so it's nice to have this collaboration in the city. Um, and uh, excited to talk about this, uh, uh, just another tool, I think, in the toolbox as we've been hearing about treating difficult disease. Um, I, I don't have any uh, financial disclosures uh, related to this, but we are starting to do some work, including some research work, uh, trying to understand how to uh, best use these uh, uh, devices. Uh, so to start, I'd like to talk about what the brachytherapy with the uh, surgically targeted radiation is, how this implant works, uh, how the workflow has been working at, at our site, and uh, then uh, how we're going to be able to study this to see if it uh, really does have some efficacy uh, and who are the best patients to treat with, uh, with this technology. So uh, as we've been hearing, uh, local recurrence really remains a, a main problem for both primary and metastatic tumors. Uh, even the best surgery we know is not a cure, as we heard Dr. Binder say earlier. And so we need to rely on other therapies uh, to treat residual disease because most of the disease does tend to come back at the site where we've operated. And so uh, there are obviously a number of approaches which can be combined, uh, systemic therapies, external beam radiation. Uh, and then as we know, when you're looking at a resection cavity, there's a desire to think, well, that disease is down there. What can we put in there? People have tried chemotherapy, and there is some data behind it, but uh, it, the application of use remains somewhat challenging. And then uh, brachytherapy. And going back and looking at uh, uh, the role of brachytherapy, uh, it, it has been actually fairly extensively studied earlier on. There was a lot of enthusiasm from case series uh, level of data. Uh, but then as two randomized controlled studies looked at, uh, they were not able to show efficacy using some of the earlier implants, particularly uh, radioactive iodine sources, worked well in things like prostate cancer, but unfortunately in the brain, uh, it was not effective. Now, interestingly, looking at some of the subsets of the patients, there were some patients that had a nice tail with longer survival, uh, but uh, probably some of the side effects, such as the, the really high rates of radiation necrosis from these implanted seeds, and then just the fact that uh, having to stereotactically target them was quite onerous. It took a long time to get the radiation sources implanted. And radioactive iodine has a, a long uh, half-life up to about 60 days. Um, and so uh, there's an interest then in using another source, which is uh, radioactive cesium. Uh, and uh, initially, uh, there's been groups trying to uh, come up with ways to implant these. They call it str string uh, of beads and trying to make a barrel. Uh, again, quite uh, a lot of work to get these implanted and then also to come up with consistent dosing. And so I think that's where the innovation comes in uh, with uh, this uh, particular uh, device is that it's uh, taken those radioactive cesium seeds and spaced them out reliably in a collagen matrix. Uh, this really helps with uh, predictable dosimetry, but also ease of application. Uh, you can see uh, that's what the implant looks like, and it's got uh, kind of like other pieces of dirigen that we're familiar with seeing. There's a bumpy side and a smooth side, kind of helps surgeons. We need fairly simple, straightforward things like that. But uh, the beads are actually offset, so they're, they're biased towards the smooth side. Uh, and that means that the, the bumpy side has a little extra uh, surface. Uh, and so that's the typically implanted side is going to be the bumpy side. And if we look at the dosimetry uh, curves uh, in the uh, we see that uh, as the uh, r radiation dosimetry comes out, by being offset to the bumpy side, you achieve about 60 gray of uh, radiation reliably at about a fifth, uh, five millimeter depth uh, with that orientation of those beads. The, the dose that's coming off is very high, but over a very uh, small area, uh, which is why it can be quite effective in that, in that local environment. The cesium also has a much shorter half-life. Uh, and uh, as the collagen breaks down, it becomes inert. Uh, these don't have to be removed. So there's a lot of ease of use that's uh, gone into it that's benefited from the learning that were the challenges in some of those uh, earlier trials. So uh, how is this being applied right now? Well, these gamma tiles, uh, because there was previous brachytherapy being used, they were able to get FDA clearance in 2018 for being used in recurrent tumors, uh, and uh, by 2020 uh, for any type of tumors, uh, based essentially mostly on safety data that we'll talk about. And so that is frequently where it's being applied right now. Uh, but uh, right now, the focus has tended to be on recurrent disease and things that don't have well-established standards of care. Uh, so where did the, this initial safety data come from? Most of it came from uh, one study out of uh, the BNI. It was essentially a, a single arm uh, study uh, following patients along. Uh, these were people who were felt to be unlikely to be uh, 
well treated uh, with surgery alone. Um, and uh, so it was a number of different uh, tumor types. Uh, you can see the different histologies there. Also some primary, but mostly recurrent disease. Uh, and so the, uh, if the patient was enrolled into this uh, essentially registry uh, for safety uh, and uh, consented, then uh, the tumor was resected and the, the devices were implanted. Uh, and so the, if they were selected, uh, quite a few of the times they could be implanted, just showing that there is an ease of use. Uh, and when stratified by the different tumor types, you can see that there was actually fairly good effectiveness. Uh, although again, these, when it, there's no comparator arm, it's hard to say exactly what the efficacy is. So really this was mostly a focus on safety. Uh, but looking at local recurrence uh, for uh, meningiomas, and especially higher grade meningiomas, uh, compared to historical controls, there's a, a fairly good local control. Uh, for recurrent glioblastoma, again, uh, uh, fairly uh, good local control uh, compared with uh, historical. Uh, and uh, then also uh, being applied for metastatic disease. And uh, particularly in, for patients with metastatic disease that had been previously radiated or treated, uh, this is a nice option to have available. Uh, and uh, I think importantly, the, uh, the thing that's allowed ongoing use of this is that there was a good safety profile with fairly low number of adverse events, essentially similar to uh, what we see just from regular cranial uh, operations. Uh, so uh, some local hematomas, uh, wound infection, rates very similar to what we see in standard operations, did not seem to be increased in this uh, registry compared to a normal operative uh, practice. So uh, what are some of the, the ongoing data uh, here? There's a, a several groups that are looking at it. This was uh, initial safety data just from the uh, Sloan Kettering group. And we see that the red bar and the blue bar, the, the lines there are accepted dose limits. And so uh, if you just measured uh, how much dose is being emitted by these patients, uh, those are the individual patients that they'd implanted on the bottom. Those bars are well below the safety limits. So again, going along with this being uh, a very localized radiation uh, source, it, it, once the bone is put back on, very uh, little dose is being emitted and then it's there for only a short period of time. Uh, now the, that group also followed up these patients because uh, who they were looking at were uh, metastatic tumors that had already received stereotactic radiation and then having local recurrence. This is quite a challenging group to treat because if you've already been radiated and the tumor still comes back uh, or has a lot of edema around it, that's a, that's a real challenge. And uh, so when they reoperated, uh, what they found was very high rates of local control, 92% still at 12 months in that local disease. Uh, now, there well, were a number of these patients that did have signs uh, by imaging of radiation necrosis, uh, but only uh, half of the patients had imaging signs actually had symptoms from that. So probably less radiation necrosis than seeing from other, uh, uh, certainly uh, what we saw in the past. Uh, now, as the uh, collagen breaks down, sometimes you'll see these uh, imaging evidence of these the seeds settling or uh, in one case got into a, a ventricle and migrated, uh, but in, in no uh, instances did that actually cause a, a symptom. And so I, I suppose theoretically that's something we need uh, to watch out for uh, if the collagen breaks down or the seed's going somewhere, but probably uh, similar to other uh, types of uh, uh, agents that we leave in resection cavities. Uh, another group of patients that's uh, being explored is by the group in Minnesota. And uh, they now have uh, some very encouraging data for recurrent glioblastoma patients. Uh, they looked at uh, all comers. There's uh, patients with both second and third uh, recurrences uh, by both methylated and unmethylated uh, subtypes. And they showed that overall uh, th their uh, survival in all these patients was uh, over 24 months and uh, even much better in the methylated uh, patients. Um, and so the, some uh, very encouraging early data uh, coming out of that group. So uh, then currently, uh, who are, uh, who's this treatment most indicated for? Probably right now, re uh, recurrent patients, recurrent metastasis, recurrent uh, gliomas. And then uh, otherwise, uh, if uh, the, there's already a standard of care, the patient should, should receive that first. 
And so the way we're approaching that in terms of our workflow is uh, when a patient comes up, they need to be assessed by both the, the surgery team and the radiation oncology team. And so we're, we're very big on the, the team-based medicine. So we'll both uh, meet with the patient and uh, go over the, that option. If, uh, if a patient is seen to be a candidate for uh, the surgically targeted radiation, then we use their uh, imaging scans to uh, define what area uh, needs to be treated. Um, and uh, so that, that helps us estimate uh, the number of tiles we need to order. And this is sort of an important logistic issue because uh, it, when the tiles, uh, when you choose the number of tiles you think you need for a certain operation, uh, they need to be uh, uh, created so that the radiation source is uh, active. And so you need about five days of lead time. Uh, so that's just a, a logistics issue to, to think about in terms of timing surgery. And then uh, th that way you can uh, have the device ready and the radiation team, uh, radiation oncology team comes to the OR when we're ready to implant. Uh, this is uh, how the, the tiles are packaged in a radiation safe uh, box and they can be stored at the facility until they're ready to come to the OR. So to walk through a, a case, this was a, a 43 year old man, quite a high functional individual um, and had uh, a right parietal tumor, had an initial uh, excellent resection uh, that was uh, done at, at Swedish, but uh, then uh, even after receiving the standard stoop about 11 months later began developing recurrent symptoms. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, his imaging showed what was, uh, again, w in the theme of a locally recurrent disease, looked like the disease was coming back to the prior resection site. Uh, he uh, was uh, someone who really uh, was highly informed and involved in his own care, was considering a lot of different uh, approaches. Uh, but uh, uh, w when he uh, looked into things, he decided that uh, he wanted to proceed with uh, the surgically targeted radiation. Uh, and so we came up uh, with a plan uh, to use fluorescent guided resection and do uh, motor mapping. Uh, and, uh, and then we uh, did an evaluation. Uh, when you're measuring for the tiles, uh, there's a few different surface area calculations you can come up with. Uh, you try to, uh, based on the, the experience uh, that they've seen with cavity re, uh, contraction, uh, estimate the number of tiles you're going to need. So uh, from these measurements, we figured that we needed four tiles. Uh, we were able to order those. And then uh, we uh, went and did the resection. You can see the, the orientation of our tiles here. The problem that we ran into is that during the uh, resection, the, the tumor that was recurring anteriorly closest to the motor strip, uh, as we, we could still see the uh, pink fluorescence there, but as we were resecting, we were starting to get a signal uh, and uh, when we stimulated. And so that limited us anteriorly. So what we were actually able to do is, uh, for the posterior por portions of the cavity, we were able to uh, keep our tiles turned uh, with the a normal a bumpy side out. But where we were worried there might be residual disease, we turned the tiles around, and that actually increases your amount of dose going anteriorly, because now you have just that one millimeter margin. You still have a safety profile uh, uh, next to the tile, but you're going to get more anterior extension and more dosimetry coverage. Uh, so he tolerated the operation well, a little bit of increased weakness and then recovered. He was able to be discharged home. And then the radiation team comes up with these really nice dosimetry plans about uh, how much uh, uh, coverage you're getting uh, by the uh, predict predicted fall off by where the seeds are. Uh, and so it was a nice coverage of all the area. There's just the, that small bit of residual enhancement, which uh, we don't have the corresponding MRI, but it did cover on the MRI uh, to the 60 gray. Uh, now, he did develop a, a small pseudomeningocele seal that actually we placed a lumbar drain and it resolved. He did not develop a wound infection, just the CSF collection that then went, went away. And his scalp now, uh, a couple of months later, looked fine. It was flat, but that was something that we're watching out for. Uh, uh, carefully. And uh, he's actually made a, a really nice recovery. And at six months uh, post-op, his resection cavity is still looking really good. And he's, uh, he's on to some second line agents uh, uh, working with his neuro-oncologist here. So I think we do still need uh, to, to better understand uh, who are the best patients to, to get this. And also, uh, we have, when previous trials have not shown uh, efficacy, we need well-designed trials to show efficacy. And so there's a number of studies looking at that right now. Um, there's uh, uh, two uh, 
big uh, multi-site uh, studies going on. One is just the, the registry, which is the start registry, essentially looking at safety. Uh, and starting up is this uh, Rhodes trial, which is uh, actually a randomized controlled trial. So that'll be a nice level of evidence. And a couple of uh, single site uh, uh, studies, uh, including the, the Minnesota one looking at uh, GBM and uh, the Sloan Kettering one looking at uh, uh, metastatic disease. So there's essentially the, the registry right now is enrolling all patients that are receiving uh, the uh, implants to mostly look for safety uh, and to see if uh, there are any adverse effects uh, with uh, after implant. Uh, so, so far, uh, the, since the study started in 2020, um, there's been 72 patients uh, that have uh, had a far long enough follow-up to really evaluate. Uh, and uh, so far, looking at adverse events, uh, this is the, the, the different types of tumors. It's, it's a wide range, kind of a basket study, like uh, the, the Barrow study, but this is just a registry. Um, so overall, about 8% uh, complications in these patients. There was one uh, hemorrhage that occurred at the, the site of resection uh, in a recurrent uh, uh, high-grade glioma patient. Uh, and uh, then uh, overall, the wound effects have actually been fairly low, one, the one pseudomeningocele, uh, and, uh, but no increased r rate of infection right now. Uh, and so that's overall looking fairly favorable in, in this uh, small number of patients that have been enrolled in the registry so far. Uh, but I think uh, getting randomized controlled data will be uh, uh, more powerful for showing uh, the effect of this treatment. And so uh, this study that's going on uh, is looking at uh, patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease and then uh, randomizing them to either surgery plus implanted radiation tiles at the time versus surgery plus the stereotactic radio surgery. Uh, so they need to have one dominant lesion that's the target to go after and then potentially up to uh, three other lesions that are amenable to radio surgery treatment. So that's how the arms are going to break up. Uh, we're just getting uh, going and rolling uh, with, uh, with this trial. And uh, the primary outcome is going to be uh, looking at the uh, local recurrence within that surgical bed and then a the number of secondary outcomes that they're, they're going to be looking at. So I think in conclusion, you know, this is a, a, another a tool in the armamentarium. Uh, and it seems that these uh, cesium implants uh, coming in this uh, collagen matrix is, is a nice, efficient way to uh, deliver this uh, brachytherapy. Uh, so I think it's encouraging to think that uh, this is a, another treatment that we have available uh, when we know we haven't surgically cured the disease, but uh, we're doing something else to treat and try and prevent recurrence. Uh, and certainly we're going to need to uh, have more powerful data to say uh, who's going to benefit from this type of treatment. But I think it also does continue to show that there is a role for uh, doing good surgery uh, because we need to have most of the tumor cells removed so that the radiation can reach out to where any of that residual disease is left behind. So using our adjuncts like fluorescent guided surgery and, and all the other things we do to get the most disease out with, uh, with an operation is still important. Uh, and so I'd like to certainly acknowledge all the uh, collaborators, the other sites that are working on this, and uh, Dr. Pham is our radiation oncologist, and Dr. Bonham, our, our neuro-oncologist. So thank you very much for, uh, again, for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how intensive is the uh, treatment planning and everything with, with regard to the radiation <coughs> oncology team? Do they have a lot of uh, work they have to do, basically, to help these patients, or are they kind of a side? Yeah, it's important. I think we, we feel we need to feel like we're collaborating, uh, but I think most of their work is actually the dosimetry and uh, feeling uh, after it's implanted, we get a, a thin cut CT to see exactly where those seeds are, and then they can uh, use that to look at the dosimetry lines and predict by the distance uh, how far uh, our, our treatment is going uh, to see how we're covering the cavity. Uh, but in terms of the, the preoperative planning, essentially it's just making sure that the patients are aware of radiation safety information and then going over that those surface area calculations. Uh, and right now we've been working with, uh, like Dr. Zabramski is down at, at uh, Barrow. He's been a kind of a, someone that we look at scans with because he has a lot of experience with uh, when you contour that, that volume. It's not necessarily a straightforward uh, volume calculation. So trying to say, like, uh, how much coverage are we going to need and then how many t implants and tiles are we going to need. Yeah. It's really encouraging that the, uh, 
complication rate is so low because I remember the old days with uh, radioactive seeds of iodine were quite high. Yeah, yeah, that, I think that's been really nice to see that something about that collagen matrix, given that little barrier, seems to uh, really help with that. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thanks again for inviting me. Coming all the way yeah. up. Yeah.